Okay, second video on structural change. I guess there's going to be four videos. <laughs> Substitution effects, income effects, and then reality. So second video, substitution effects. So here we build a model where there are strong substitution effects. And if I remember rightly, there's no income effect whatsoever in this model. And then we're going to think, OK, does this model match up to reality? Then we're going to do the same with an income effects model. Then we're going to talk about reality. OK, so substitution effects. Let me see if I'm. Yeah, OK. So what does our model look like? We've got two products and we're going to label them Y1 and Y2. And Y1 is gamma L K L L. I really should change this notation, but never mind. And Y2 is gamma R. K R R. Those are the production functions. So what are these inputs? Gammas, this is gamma, yeah. The gammas are parameters, the k's are productivity levels or knowledge stocks, and the l's are the physical inputs of labor and the resource. Okay, so we've got two different goods. This could be like education, and this could be like flights or something. And we're assuming here that education is produced by pure labor and flights are produced by pure resources or pure energy, if you like. And this is all, we're assuming a sort of representative firm and perfect competition. And when we aggregate up, we can, if we like, think of a big L for aggregate labor and a big R for aggregate resource use and so on. But how do these, how do consumers value these products against each other? We, tell, we say that this aggregate production, Y, is a function of the quantities of Y1 and Y2. Yeah? And they're not perfect substitutes. If they were perfect substitutes, Y would just be Y1 plus Y2. Potentially with some uh, potentially with some pre-multiplying numbers, but but they're not perfect substitutes. Consumers want a mixture of the two. Okay, they don't just want either all education or all flights. They want a mixture. And how strong are their preferences for that mixture? Well, we can have that determined by a parameter, can't we? A parameter, ta da, epsilon. <laughs> we can do a CES function. So y is a CES function of y1 and y2. When epsilon is one, they're perfect substitutes. When epsilon is naught, this collapses to Cobb Douglas. When epsilon's minus infinity, it's Leon's F. And there's no substitutability. Okay. Keep going. So now let's assume that labor big L, which is the same as little L in the end, I don't know why I bothered, and the ratio of the input prices WR to WM evolve exogenously. And the endogenous thing is total energy use, R. So energy gets sort of sucked in due to changes in L, um, WL and WR. And this is pretty straightforward. Oh gosh, I've got to do this without any help. <laughs> Briefly, derive two different expressions for the ratio of the prices of the aggregate goods. Firstly, by comparing their marginal contribution to Y, and secondly, by comparing their unit production costs. Okay, Whew. yeah, we can do this. <laughs> I'm kind of exhausted already, never mind. Um, 
Okay. So let's assume, let's assume some, so let's draw a picture of the economy. Firm households here, we've got two firms. One of them is taking labor, the other one is taking the resource. We're not really sure where this resource is coming from. This isn't a full general equilibrium model. Um, and there's output coming out here. This is y1 and this is y2 oh i'm going to pause the video for a sec oops oh no. <laughs> that was my daughter coming home from school i'm still in the garage um yeah so i totally lost where i was here right now so we've got these two products and then they put together many inputs into a new system and aggregate systems out here. So let's think about the person running this firm's problem, which is basically just to buy these two goods, put them together, and sell the combined good. There's no other inputs, there's no labor or anything or capital here. It's just these two inputs, stick them together, package them up and sell them. Okay. So then it's just a convenient way to think about the problem. So then we have the profit of this guy is just Y, because we can normalize the price of this to one, can't we? I think I want to do that. We'll normalize it to one times or minus, we can call it P1, Y1 minus P2, Y2. Okay. And then pi dy1 equals naught. And what's that telling us? So then we need to do this business, don't we? <laughs> so it's one over epsilon times this to the one minus epsilon over epsilon, which is one over epsilon times y to the one minus epsilon. But we know that one over epsilon is gonna cancel when we go inside, so I'm not gonna write it down. Uh, y to the one minus epsilon, we go inside, epsilon cancels the one over epsilon, alpha y1 to the epsilon over y1. So alpha y1 to the epsilon over y1 minus p1 equals naught. So we can write equals p1, then we can bring this y1 up and we can say that. Okie doke. And then by symmetry, we can say that y to the one minus epsilon one minus alpha y2 to the epsilon equals p2 y2 briefly i'm going back to my notes derive two different expressions for the ratio of the prices okay so we want the ratio of the prices so putting those two together we get P1 over P2 equals the Y's cancel alpha over one minus alpha. Um, Y1 to the epsilon minus one over Y2 to the epsilon minus one. So that's Y1 over Y2 to the epsilon minus one. So that's our first expression. What's, how do we get the second expression? Secondly, compare their unit production costs. So what does it cost to make a unit of Y1? It costs 
So if you want a unit of Y1, you need how many units of L? You need one over gamma L KL units of L, don't you? So the cost of that must be, the cost of a unit of L is WL. So it's WL over gamma L KL, isn't it? The bigger gamma L KL is, the less L you need the lower is the price. Remember, we're assuming perfect competition, so we can do this. And it's so straightforward because it's a linear production function with only one input, this is why it's so straightforward. You could set up a profit maximization problem for these, this guy and this guy as well. Get the same thing. By the way, if you wanted to make a proper model out of this, you need to send some of this to Okay. So what's that? That's P1. It's P, yeah, P1 over P2 is equals that over the symmetric expression, which is WR over gamma R KR. So putting that together, we should get WL over WR, gamma R KR over gamma L KL. So that's two expressions for the relative prices. Okie doke. So, what are we supposed to do next? Use these two expressions to eliminate the price ratio and to show that. <coughs> okay. So, we want to eliminate the price ratio and find an expression with R's, L's, gamma R's, KR's, WR's, and WL's. We haven't got any R's and L's here, but we do have Y1's and Y2's. So, clearly, we're going to need to substitute, aren't we? But let's just keep going for a while. So, we can put this equal to this. And we get alpha over one minus alpha. Let's do the substitution. Gamma L K L L to the epsilon minus one over gamma R K R R. Equals W L over W R gamma R KR over gamma L KL. Okie doke. So let's multiply, well, let's start by multiplying both sides by one minus alpha over alpha. So then we have one minus alpha over alpha. That disappears. Now, let's raise everything to the power of, no, let's get rid of this first. So let's multiply both sides by KRR over KLL to the epsilon minus one. No, 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 sorry. We want L and R left here. We want multiply both sides by gamma L KR, gamma R KR over gamma L KL to the epsilon minus one. So we have this to the one, and then we add epsilon minus one. One plus epsilon minus one is epsilon. So then we've got rid of this. So now we raise this 
to the 1 over 1 minus epsilon, and we end up with, I'm wondering where to, where to write this, I'll do it down here, L over R, and we can turn it into the aggregate big L over big R is 1 minus alpha over alpha, WL over WR, gamma R, KR over gamma L, KL to the epsilon, all to the 1 over epsilon minus 1. Maybe I'm being a bit bold by rubbing this out. I haven't even checked whether it's right yet. One minus alpha over alpha, gamma R K R over gamma L K L. To the minus epsilon. Okay. <laughs> oh. Is this right? Blimey. So it's the other way around, isn't it? But then my alpha and one minus alpha are wrong. Oh, let me pause this and try and work out what's happened. Okay, I found what happened. I didn't, with the small text, I didn't read my expression on the previous page. For some reason, I chose to define these epsilons the other way around, right? So minus, minus, minus. So wherever there's an epsilon anywhere here, we need to change its sign, don't we? So that's plus, minus plus, minus, minus, uh, minus, minus. And then if you then work through this, it'll be, it's equivalent to what we've got in the slides. But sorry about that. Um, so L over R, is this to the one over minus one plus epsilon. So we can just say R over L is this to the one plus epsilon. And then we basically pretty much got exactly the expression there. Okay, and then if we set epsilon equal to naught, we end up with R over L is one minus alpha over alpha to the one WL over WR. And this to the naught is just one. So we end up with that, which is called the factor share as a constant, aren't they? WRR over WLL is one minus alpha over alpha is called buckness. So in the aggregate, ta-da, if we set epsilon equal to naught, we end up with, if you take the bird's eye view and put all these in the box, don't distinguish them, you see a Cobb-Douglas production function. Okay. But it's arising in quite a different way. The production function for the actual goods that are consumed are not Cobb-Douglas at all, but then it's all about the consumer's trade-offs between the two goods and how they like a combination. Okay, so what have we got? Now set epsilon equal to naught. This implies that equation one is called Douglas. The aggregate elasticity of substitution between energy and labor is one. Thus, we have the constant share result and 100% rebound. Energy demand is not affected by the direction of technological change, exclamation mark. So it's like if we raise KR, then we need less R to make a unit of Y2. But Y2 gets cheaper 
consumers buy more of Y2, rebound takes away the effect of increasing KR, and there's no effect on the factor shares and so on. The rebound, you have 100% rebound. And actually, R actually goes up because your overall productivity in the economy has gone up. So more resources will get sucked in. The result is intuitive. We have two products, one made entirely using labor, the other using only energy. When the products are combined in a Cobb-Douglas function on the consumption side, um, the products take constant shares, labor and energy must also take constant shares. Yeah. So you see, if you have Cobb-Douglas here, then these two products take constant shares. And since one of them has only labor as an input and the other has only the resource, labor and the resource will also take constant shares. So in this economy, boosting AR, or if we call RE for energy, boosting AE doesn't help cut energy use. But what happens if we tax energy use? Well, you've got a unit elasticity because the aggregate overall bird's eye view production function is called Douglas. We have a unit elasticity of substitution between the goods. So if we raise the price of energy by 1%, we will reduce energy consumption by 1%, won't we? Um, if we raise the price of energy by 1%, we'll raise the cost of this good by 1%. So consumers will choose less of this and more of this, we need less energy. Okay, so taxes are pretty effective in this setup, but raising, having government subsidies or whatever to raise resource efficiency is a waste of time. Okay, not gonna help. It might give you potentially more welfare because we're using stuff more efficiently, but it won't cut energy use. Okay, so that's the end of that video. Let's see if I can stop it.